Good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for braving the elements today in order to participate in what we hope will be a fascinating program, Father Ed, the story of Bill W.'s spiritual sponsor. My name is Steve Dalton, and I am the head librarian at Boston College's Theology and Ministry Library, and I have the great privilege of introducing our guest speaker today. Before doing so, however, I would like to take just a moment to thank our co-sponsors for this event. Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry, the Center for Ignatian Spirituality, the Jesuit Institute, the Church in the 21st Century, and the Boston College Libraries. This was truly a collaborative effort, and I am so grateful to my generous and tireless BC colleagues. By any measure, Don Eden Goldstein has had an intriguing career. She began her working life as a rock and roll historian and then went on to hold editorial positions at the New York Post and the Daily News before publishing her first book in 2006. Since then, she has become an award-winning author whose books have sold more than 60,000 copies worldwide in 10 different languages. Her books include My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, and Remembering God's Mercy, which won first place in the inspirational category of the Association of Catholic Publishers Excellence in Publishing Awards in 2017. Dawn was the first woman to earn a doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, and she is currently finishing up her work on her licentiate in canon law from Catholic University. With such credentials, it's no surprise that she has taught in universities and seminaries in the United States, England, and in India. Today, we gather to consider Dawn most, Dawn's most recent book, Father Ed, the story of Bill W.'s spiritual sponsor. This is the first and only biography of Father Edward Dowling, S.J., a Jesuit priest who has likely touched your life or the life of someone you love, though you may never have heard of him. I certainly had not until uh, I became aware of Dawn's work. Dawn will speak to us for about 45 minutes, and then she'll be happy to entertain your questions for the balance of our time. Please join me in welcoming Dawn Eden Goldstein. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you, likewise, uh, thanks to all the co-sponsors that he mentioned. You know, there are so many of them that I that I don't want to trust myself in trying to remember the name of each of each one for fear I'll mess up. But I'm very, very grateful uh, to you all. It's it's a great honor uh, to to be here. Um, now, uh, I've I've spoken to many distinguished audiences in my years as a Catholic author. I don't think I've ever spoken to an audience as distinguished as this one here at, at Boston College. I just, you know, from hearing from, from Steve about the, the, dif the different uh, faculty uh, members, uh, as, as well as students and people from outside and staff uh, who, are, who are here. Uh, so it is quite, overwhelming uh, for me, even though Steve mentioned my academic credentials. Still, as he also mentioned, I got my start as a rock and roll historian. One doesn't forget where one comes from, which in my case is largely the East Village in Hoboken, New Jersey. 
and so, and so, um, you know, and so still, uh, it is somewhat uh, overwhelming uh, for 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 me speaking before this audience. But despite the distinction of so many people here, um, I can say that even though there may even be another rock and roll historian here, I think I have one distinction that not even the most distinguished person here can claim. Uh, so uh, this distinction that I have that I don't think anyone else here can claim is that I personally met and interacted with the late Ed Cobb. Now, who was Ed Cobb, you may ask? Well, his name may not be familiar to you, uh, but um, you may start to recognize him if I say that he sang bass in the four preps. And if that isn't enough, then I shall try to sing to you, although I'm sure there are better singers here than I am. Uh, he wrote this song, dun, 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 yes, the victory anthem of the Red Sox, Dirty Water. I met and interacted with the author of the legend, the legendary author of the legendary Dirty Water by the Standells. Uh, so, you know, there you go, my brush with celebrity, which I'll be more than happy to discuss details of during the Q&A. Uh, but I'm here to speak with you not about Ed Cobb, but about another Ed, uh, this other Ed, likewise has a connection with baseball. Uh, he was a star player in high school and college uh, and even tried out for the major leagues. Uh, but today, uh, Edward Dowling is better known, uh, best known for his ministry as Father Ed, as a, a Jesuit priest. And he's especially known uh, for the influence he had on the 12-step recovery movement through his 20-year friendship with Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, Bill Wilson is widely regarded as one of the greatest human beings of the 20th century. Uh, the AA Fellowship that he co-founded in 1935 and the 12 steps that he composed have been sources of healing for untold millions of people throughout the world. Yet, because AA is not affiliated with any religion or sect, and because Bill Wilson himself was not a member of any church, people are often surprised to learn that for 20 years, Bill Wilson's closest spiritual advisor was a Jesuit. Uh, after Father Ed died in 1960, Bill said, and I quote, he said this of Father Ed, he was the greatest and most gentle soul that I may ever know. And even during Father Ed's lifetime, uh, Bill wrote of him in a letter to a member of AA, I think he is one of the great men of our time, a genuine saint. Uh, now, I'm not myself a member of AA, which makes me uh, what Father Ed would call underprivileged. But that's okay, because Father Ed was underprivileged too, uh, which makes it all the more surprising that he, as a Catholic priest, dedicated the last 20 years of his life uh, from, from when he first heard about AA at the beginning of 1940, uh, when uh, Father Ed was, uh, was 41 um, years old um, until his death in April 1960. Uh, Father Ed dedicated those last 20 years in large part to ministering to alcoholics, narcotics addicts, and many other people who had problems that caused them shame. 
Uh, when I first learned of Father Ed in 2008, uh, from an article written by an alcoholic friend of mine, that was what most impressed me, that he was so devoted to this fellowship of alcoholics, even though he was not uh, an alcoholic himself. Now, there are many other things about Father Ed's life besides his ministry to alcoholics uh, that were uh, significant uh, about him. Um, uh, Fa Father Ed, before uh, his uh, ordination, actually before he entered the Jesuits, uh, he worked for a year for a daily newspaper, the St. Louis Globe Democrat, uh, as a journalist. Um, once he became a Jesuit, he maintained his ties with journalists. He was a, a member at large of the newspaper guild of St. Louis. Uh, and uh, he also was an expert on democracy and uh, for uh, many years was a lecturer in the summer school of Catholic action uh, as, as, a, as a Jesuit priest. Uh, and as a lecturer at the Summer School of Catholic Action, he primarily discussed proportional representation, what's now known as ranked choice voting as a tool for democracy. Um, so many of his uh, visits here to Boston College were spent speaking about proportional uh, representation. Um, when, uh, it, it, but, it, you know, it, it, it's funny, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction that Steve just gave, uh, there never has been a full biography of Father Ed. Up until now, the only things published about him uh, had to do with his association with Bill Wilson. Uh, in fact, a priest who read Father Ed wrote to me upon reading it, saying that he was expecting this book likewise to be just about Father Ed's association with AA. So uh, this priest was surprised upon picking up this 378 page book uh, to find that it takes 90 pages for Father Ed even to get ordained. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm not going to devote an equal percentage of time to of this talk to uh, discussing Father Ed's uh, pre uh, AA life, uh, because it is his work with AA uh, that uh, his greatest, that is his greatest uh, legacy. Uh, so uh, for the remainder of this talk, um, I'll discuss Father Ed's uh, first encounter with AA uh, and uh, his first meeting also with Bill Wilson, and uh, then I'll uh, discuss uh, lastly, uh, his greatest contribution to AA through uh, his spiritual guidance of Bill and particularly what uh, Father Ed showed Bill Wilson with regard to the relationship between Ignatian spirituality, particularly the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and the 12 steps. Um, first, uh, I should say uh, for those here uh, who are not uh, familiar with AA and the 12 Steps, uh, I should say a few words just about AA and the 12 Steps. So AA is a fellowship of people who are seeking to uh, attain and maintain sobriety from alcohol, and they do this uh, through uh, the through the meetings that they have in which uh, they will discuss what's written in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which uh, contains stories of individuals who attained sobriety and also uh, contains uh, the method, the means by which uh, the first 100 members of AA uh, attained sobriety. And these uh, methods have been distilled by the co-founder of AA, Bill Wilson, uh, into 12 steps, which uh, basically map out a program. Interestingly enough, alcohol uh, is um, hardly mentioned in the, 
in the 12 uh, steps. Uh, it's mentioned only in the first step, uh, which is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, uh, that our lives had become unmanageable. And after that first step, interestingly enough, there, there's no step that actually says we stopped drinking. <laughs> uh, it's that the steps then go on to uh, step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Interestingly, not just, it doesn't say sobriety, it says to sanity. And then step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care to God as we understood him. Uh, that phrase, as we understood him, is very important. Uh, the AA does not have a conception of God imposed upon uh, him or her. The uh, member of AA takes on uh, for herself, himself, uh, whatever the AA member determines is the higher power to which the AA will surrender. Even an, an, an atheist can be a member of AA uh, through acknowledging any higher power greater uh, than herself, himself, um, just uh, any, anything to which the person can, can surrender and can begin to restructure uh, her or his uh, own, own life. Uh, into uh, sanity and, and sobriety. So, uh, so AA, since it was co-founded by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob in 1935, uh, has continued through its 12 steps, also through 12 uh, traditions that, uh, that Bill uh, Wilson uh, composed later on with input from other members, AA has continued in a form that is still largely recognizable as its original uh, form, uh, which is just remarkable and which, you know, for someone who is a, a Christian like myself, certainly suggests some form of divine intervention um, and, and divine guidance. Uh, certainly, Father Ed felt very strongly uh, that AA had divine guidance. Uh, so I want to tell you first about uh, Father Ed's first uh, encounter with AA. Um, if I could just have a time check from my timekeeper here, because I do lose, lose track because I get so excited about this half an hour. That's what I thought. That's great. Let me just take a, take a sip then. Father Ed first encountered AA uh, through a, a journalist friend of his. Uh, I am permitted, even though this journalist uh, was uh, a member of AA, I've been permitted by uh, the uh, journalist's uh, daughter uh, to, uh, br to break his anonymity. Uh, his name was Edwin Leahy. Uh, he was at that time a uh, leading news reporter for the Chicago uh, Daily News. Uh, he and he later uh, became uh, really the nation's uh, leading Washington, D.C. reporter uh, as a reporter for the Knight Ritter Wire Service. But in January of 1940, uh, Ed Leahy was uh, a drunk whose drinking had caused his wife to become uh, estranged. She had run back to uh, stay with family and taken uh, the couple's two uh, young, very young uh, daughters. And uh, Leahy's um, boss had all, at the Chicago Daily News was threatening to fire him if he didn't dry up. Now, Father Ed at that time, it was nine years into his, into his priesthood, uh, he was uh, working at the Queen's work, which was uh, a Jesuit apostolate uh, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, which is where Father Ed was from and spent almost his entire life. Uh, and uh, Father Ed was ostensibly an associate editor at the Queen's work. It was a publishing uh, apostolate. But in fact, he was, uh, in the word of a Protestant uh, newspaper uh, friend of his, uh, he was 
and he was God's ambassador to humanity. Uh, Father Ed, thanks to the kindness of his boss, who was another great Jesuit, Father Daniel A. Lord. Father Ed, when he wasn't touring with the Summer School of Catholic Action or giving other lectures on democracy, he was sitting in his office at the Queen's work and the world was coming to him uh, with problems, people with all kinds of problems, because they sensed that here was someone who no matter what they had done, uh, would understand them and would find some way to help them, often practical ways. Father Ed knew people at City Hall and could make phone calls and help them. He was a true reporter uh, in that sense. Uh, he kept those talents of investigative uh, journalism. Uh, but most of all, he helped people spiritually. There was a certain gravitas about Father Ed uh, in that uh, people could even see looking at him that he was a man acquainted with pain. Um, as I mentioned, he had uh, been uh, a baseball player, a star baseball player through, um, through high school and college, and he continued to be quite athletic as a young Jesuit during his novitiate. Uh, he was considered the star soccer player in the, in the novitiate, which was quite a lot uh, in the uh, Jesuit novitiate in St. Louis in the late 19 uh, teens, uh, when uh, the novitiate numbered dozens of, of strong men, many of them uh, veterans of World War I. Uh, but when Father Ed had just made his first uh, vows at the end of the novitiate, when he was 23 uh, years old, years old, uh, in uh, October 1921, he was taking a walk with another uh, Jesuit uh, junior when he was, uh, he felt a twinge in his leg, which would only later be diagnosed as a degenerative uh, form of arthritis, very severe form called ankylosing spondylitis, uh, so bad that by the time Father Ed was 30, he was walking as though he had a steel pole up his uh, spine because his, um, his uh, spine had become calcified uh, and then his leg uh, became calcified too so, so that uh, around the time of his ordination in 1931, uh, he was walking with a cane. Uh, but Father Ed used to joke about it. He didn't want people to think that he was in constant pain, which he was. Uh, he would joke that he was turning into stone or that he was becoming his own tombstone. Uh, so this priest who was so known for helping people with problems uh, was contacted in January 1940 by uh, the nun in, you know, you have to know behind every good work there's a nun somewhere. Uh, and in this case, it was the nun uh, who was at uh, the St. Uh, Vincent's uh, or or orphanage in Chicago, and she had been the one who had placed two little girls in the reporter uh, Edwin Leahy's uh, home, and, and uh, she was concerned that now this nice Catholic couple, the Leahy's, were estranged due to Ed Leahy's drinking. So uh, Father Ed worked the magic that he was known for and managed to convince Ed Leahy's wife, Grace, to come back. And he managed to extract from Ed Leahy uh, a promise that he would no longer drink. But um, that was all that Father Ed could do at that time in January 1940 because he didn't know about Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, there were very few chapters of AA uh, apart from uh, New York, the ones in New York City, Akron, Chicago. There was no AA in St. Louis at that time. Thanks to Father Ed, there very soon would be. Um, but uh, at that time, uh, there was no um, known treatment for alcoholism that worked. There were some extreme so-called treatments uh, that doctors were trying, such as electroshock therapy, uh, even uh, frontal lobotomies, 
Um, but there was nothing that had been shown uh, to work. And whatever one may say about Alcoholics Anonymous, and nowadays uh, one will see many articles from people saying AA is overrated, there are other treatments that are shown to work better, so on. But one thing is for certain, that no one can even say now that there is something that works better than AA if it wasn't for that AA was the first treatment for alcoholics ever shown to work, to work at all. It's because of Alcoholics Anonymous that alcoholics, these people who were so hopeless that all they could look forward to was being locked up in a sanitarium for the rest of their life. It's because of AA uh, that these men and women have hope. And through the extension of the 12 steps to people with other kinds of problems, which is again, largely through Father Ed being the first person to speak of a A's 12 steps as being valuable for anyone and not only alcoholics. Uh, but it, it's because of AA and the 12 steps uh, that alcoholics and addicts today can have hope, can have hope from any treatment at all. So uh, with uh, a blessing from Father Ed and with a promise to Father Ed that, uh, that Leahy would would uh, go to communion, uh, receive communion regularly and confess regularly. Uh, Ed Leahy and his wife, Grace, and their two daughters went, uh, went back from Father Ed's office at, in St. Louis to Chicago. And a few weeks later, uh, Father Ed um, made a stop in Chicago on his way to give talks uh, in the Northeast uh, to see how Leahy was doing. And he was very happy to hear that Leahy had not had a drink in those few weeks, but he grew a bit concerned uh, when Leahy told him that he had been hanging out with his old drinking buddies. In fact, he had been seeing a lot of them in regular meetings, uh, including many people uh, such as uh, his friend uh, Clem and Luke, uh, many you know, of, of these people um, whose first names are well known now to people in Chicago AA, uh, and these people who were uh, Leahy's colleagues, um, Leahy was now meeting with in this group called Alcoholics Anonymous. And when Father Ed you know, expressed a bit of concern about Leahy hanging out with his old drinking buddies, Leahy invited him to a meeting and uh, so Father Ed came to this meeting and he wrote about it afterwards in an article uh, that I quote here. Uh, I was the first person writing about Father Ed to actually find the article where he speaks in his own words about his first experience of an AA meeting. And he said, uh, first of all, you know, the people there looked rather ordinary. In other words, they, they didn't look like, you know, wild-eyed people, uh, as Father Ed put it, it looked like the family entrance to Skid Row. <laughs> uh, but then Father Ed wrote afterwards, he heard them speak, the stories began, and he says that he was transfixed, transfixed by the stories that he heard from these AA members, and that since then, he has remained transfixed, that he considers AA to be the greatest drama in America uh, today. And, you know, by that, what Father Ed was truly saying was that he saw in AA a microcosm of the whole human drama, of what it meant to be human and what it meant to flourish as a as a human being in fellowship with one another. He sensed immediately that he was sensing some kind of spirit that was present in the early Christians, which is quite interesting you know, for an alcoholic, for an AA member to hear, uh, because AA members who are familiar with their history know that uh, Bill Wilson first became sober uh, in his encounter with a, a Protestant sect called the Oxford Group, uh, which was initially known as the first century 
Christian uh, fellowship. Uh, now, Bill Wilson didn't stay involved uh, in uh, the Oxford group, and AA, as I mentioned, is um, definitively and, and, and rightly proudly uh, not officially uh, affiliated with any, uh, with any group. But um, there was a sense for Father Ed and his encounter with AA members of being in the catacombs. Uh, and afterwards, um, he, he, he uh, took a copy of the big book back with him to Chicago. The big book had only been published for a year at, at that time. And Father Ed showed uh, the big book to a fellow Jesuit who was uh, an, an alcoholic. Um, Father uh, John Marcou, who is uh, better known today for his work with his uh, brother, uh, Father, also a Jesuit, Father William Marcou. Uh, the two of them were uh, early leaders among the Jesuits in, uh, in campaigning uh, for, uh, for the, the rights of African Americans. But at that time, in, in uh, early 1940, uh, Father Marcou was a resident chaplain at uh, an alcoholic, at a sanitarium where alcoholics were being treated and he himself was being treated. And when Father Marcou saw the 12 steps, he pointed out to Father Ed that there were certain parallels in them with the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Uh, particularly, Father Marcou saw in the admission of powerlessness, the surrender to the higher power, and then in the, um, in the uh, parts of the steps that concern making a fearless self-inventory, admitting to God and to another person the nature of one's wrongs, humbly asking God to remove these failures, and then um, seeking through prayer and conscious, make, making amends, then seek, seeking through prayer and conscious contact uh, with, uh, with God uh, to, um, to uh, I don't have the, ex the exact words, uh, but to uh, continue in the upward uh, path. Um, Father uh, Marcou uh, saw um, in, all, in all of these um, the first uh, two ways of the spiritual life that are uh, that, that the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius uh, seek to guide the uh, person making the exercises through, uh, namely the purgative way of the spiritual life, uh, which is the way of uh, ridding oneself of sin by God's grace, uh, and also the illuminative way, which is the way of walking with God and learning uh, from, uh, from God as as uh, our Lord says, take my yoke uh, upon me and learn from me, for I am meek and, and humble of heart. Um, so uh, when Father Ed was enlightened by Father Marcou as to parallels between the 12 steps and the spiritual exercises, Father Ed was intrigued. Uh, because as a young Jesuit, he had been fascinated with the spiritual exercises. In fact, he had written his master's thesis at, uh, uh, at St. Louis University on uh, the psychology of the spiritual exercises as a means of training the will. Uh, so uh, Father Ed had specifically been intrigued by the spiritual exercises as a means for training oneself to, um, to uh, rid oneself of vice and to grow, of, grow in virtue. So he became fascinated with the 12 steps because he saw that, he came to see that through human history, God in different ways has been trying to impress upon human beings the way to, to grow and walk with God, and that one of the great ways through which God tried to impress this upon human beings was through, um, through the, the triple via that spiritual theologians came up with of the purgative, 
the illuminative, and finally the unitive way, which is the, the unitive being um, the height of the spiritual life, the pinnacle of of uh, being so close with God that nothing would that one would want nothing to separate one uh, from God. Um, and so Father Ed saw that um, the spiritual exercises were one way in which God had enlightened a human being to help other uh, human beings um, through this triple way. And Father Ed believed that Bill Wilson must also be this a great spiritual master to have likewise been given this way and but that through Bill, the difference was that this way was now expanded so that it could be taken up not only by Catholics, uh, but by every uh, human person of good of goodwill. Um, uh, do I have about uh, 15, 20 minutes left? Okay. 12 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so Bill sought out this great spiritual master, Bill Wilson. Uh, I tell the entire story of that uh, in, in here. Uh, I, I will tell you that at the time that Father Ed met Bill, he found Bill in a sour and frustrated mood. Uh, Bill would later say that he was on a dry drunk. Uh, this was November of 1940. Bill was very frustrated that AA had yet to take off and that most of the copies of the big book that had been printed were as the, at that time still gathering dust in a warehouse. Um, when Father Ed um, came up to see uh, Bill in Bill's uh, room where he was staying at the AA clubhouse in New York, Father Ed said to him, I'm intrigued by the connection between, or, or parallels that I'm seeing between um, your 12 steps and the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. And uh, Bill responded, never heard of him. <laughs> and Father Ed had the same response that you just had. He laughed and that broke the ice uh, between them. And uh, before Bill knew it, he was opening up to Father Ed about his frustrations. Uh, Bill later admitted that he uh, did what uh, AAs call uh, taking the fifth. He took his, made his fifth step um, with uh, Father Ed, uh, the fifth step of admitting to God and to another person the nature of his wrongs. It's funny, you know, here Bill Wilson had written uh, the 12 steps, yet he hadn't actually made all the 12 steps uh, because in writing them he was trying to put on paper the principles that had, that had uh, helped uh, the first 100 members of AA, but he himself had attained sobriety without, um, without uh, using or incorporating all of those principles. Father Ed helped him to attain to the next level of his own spiritual sobriety. Uh, Bill, as Bill was telling Father Ed of his frustration, Father Ed said to him, blessed are they who hunger and thirst. Uh, Father Ed sought to help Bill understand uh, that he was given his thirst uh, for, for a reason. And uh, Bill said to him, won't there be any satisfaction? And Father Ed said to him, no, never. And his point was, was a deeply Augustinian point in that, as Augustine says uh, in the first chapter of the Confessions, oh Lord, uh, our hearts are made, f we are, you, you made us for, for yourself, oh Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We are made to thirst, and the question is, are we going to direct our thirst above or are we going to direct it below? Now, Bill Wilson at that time might not have said that he was directing his thirst below. He would have said he was directing his thirst to something good, namely to the good of helping other alcoholics find sobriety. Father Ed, in his work with AA, as Father Ed told um, his Jesuit superior, 
um, in uh, 1942 as he uh, sought permission from his superior, which was eventually granted, thankfully. Um, he sought permission to continue his work with AAs. And he attributed uh, his uh, success with AAs to uh, what Father Ed himself called a, a rather free use of St. Ignatius Loyola's rules for discernment uh, for the second week of the spiritual exercises. Uh, those rules are rules for one who is on the illuminative way, the upward path, and who needs help discerning, distinguishing between uh, the highest good and those lesser goods that may present oneself. Um, because a lesser good might, uh, the, the enemy of our souls can use lesser goods to uh, tempt us to, uh, to stop from continuing to progress upward. And the enemy knows that in fact, there is no lateral movement on the spiritual path. We're either going upward or downward. So in Father Ed's meeting with Bill, and really for the next 20 years of Father Ed's guidance to Bill, uh, Father Ed sought to impress upon uh, Bill, uh, that the if Bill was maintaining his sobriety through working with AAs, uh, it was because um, working with AAs was not Bill's final end. Bill's final end, his final goal was heaven. And any um, satisfaction that Bill received in working with AAs was a taste of the satisfaction that he would receive in its fullness in heaven. Uh, so there would be, for Bill and for every AA, no full satisfaction on this earth, yet what God was calling each AA to do was what... Jesus was calling each of us to do while on the cross. This is something that was taught by Mother Teresa, which is very much Bill Wilson, or rather Father Ed's spirituality as well. Although uh, Father Ed was working, um, w was not aware of Mother Teresa's work at the time. Um, Jesus on the cross um, was expressing that we are to share in his thirst for souls, those were the meanings of the, that was the meaning of those words when Jesus said, I thirst. Uh, Jesus was giving to each of us a share in his own thirst for souls. That was the thirst that Father Ed believed Bill was given a great grace of being permitted to participate in this thirst of, of getting a little taste of heaven each day through his contact with the alcoholic who still suffers through carrying the message, as it says in the 12th step of AA. And uh, I will say uh, one uh, last thing um, with regard to uh, the 12 steps, Ignatian spirituality and uh, what Father Ed believed and what he taught not only Bill Wilson and members of AA, uh, but also uh, Father Ed taught this to um, his fellow priests in trying to instruct them on how to uh, accompany uh, alcoholics. Um, Father Ed believed that in the 12 steps, there was a map of the entire spiritual life, not, not only the, the purgative and the uh, illuminative way, uh, but also the unitive way. Uh, in this way, uh, Father Ed uh, differed from uh, a famous alcoholic priest named Father Ralph Pfau, uh, P-F-A-U. Uh, Father Pfau uh, believed, and also Father Marcoux, uh, only saw the purgative and the illuminative ways uh, of the spiritual life in the 12 steps. Uh, the purgative being, as I mentioned, 
the way of the spiritual life of getting rid of sin, which is the way of the first week of the spiritual exercises, and the illuminative way, which is the way of walking with God, which in the spiritual exercises is expressed primarily in the second and third weeks, uh, somewhat in the fourth week as well. Um, But uh, Father Ed also saw in the 12 steps the third way, the unitive way of the spiritual life, which is, as I mentioned, the way of never wanting to be separated from God. In the spiritual exercises, uh, the unitive way is expressed uh, in the sushi pay prayer, uh, which says, take, Lord, my entire liberty, receive my memory, my intellect, and my whole uh, will, all that I am all that I am, all that I, that I possess comes from you. I, I give it all back to you and surrender it, all to the, to surrender it all to the guidance of your holy will. Grant me your love and your grace. With these, I will be content and will ask for nothing more. Uh, well, uh, you know, some members of AA see that in what's uh, known as the third step prayer. Uh, Father Ed saw it in the uh, 11th and 12th steps of AA. The uh, 11th step being sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. That is right there in the sushi pay. Grant, grant me thy love and thy grace. With these I will be content and will ask for nothing more. And likewise in the 12 steps, in the 12th step, Having had a spiritual awakening uh, originally in, in Father Ed's um, time, when he, Father Ed first heard the steps, it was having had a spiritual experience, which even uh, more emphasizes that personal encounter. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Um, I believe that in all our affairs, Father Ed saw something uh, of the uh, contemplatio, uh, the uh, final uh, exercise of the of the spiritual exercises, the one in which the sushi play, pay is, which is to find God in all things. Uh, the spiritual exercises are ultimately apostolic. It's ultimately about... Uh, in the words of Pope Francis, who was not the first to say this, going forward, going outward, um, taking what one has and, and going outward in an apostolic uh, fashion. And that is likewise uh, the goal of, a, of AA, of the 12 st- steps, which is carrying the message, going outward. Uh, Father Ed Dowling truly believed that every alcoholic, uh, whether uh, he... Uh, or she knows it or not, is on uh, the upward path, the path to God. And in this way, Father Ed uh, prophetically understood uh, the teachings of of the Second Vatican Council, which which taught that uh, that um, while all uh, salvation is through Christ, each person of goodwill uh, who uh, follows the lights that have been given them, um, has uh, an, an opening to uh, that salvation, whether they consciously uh, know Jesus or not. Um, Father, Father Ed saw AA as, as embodying um, the path uh, to God. Um, so I'm very grateful to be able to share with you Father Ed's uh, understanding of the path to God is outlined through the spiritual exercises uh, and through AA. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, grateful to speak here, and I'll be delighted to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I understand that there are microphones, or there, there are microphones out there, did you say? Yes. 
Uh, so if anyone would like to ask a que question. Uh, yes, uh, up here, is there a microphone that could be brought? I guess, especially since this is being recorded, it's good to, um, it's good to have every, every uh, question uh, recorded. Thank you. Did I miss it, or did Father Ed ever have a drinking problem? Uh, no. Uh, Father Ed was what he himself would call underprivileged, uh, in that he uh, was not an alcoholic. Uh, he, um, he, he called himself underprivileged because he envied members of Alcoholics, a Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, he envied AA members, uh, their, their fellowship, uh, Father Ed even uh, gained uh, permission that was very, um, very uh, gladly um, granted him by Bill and and AA headquarters to attend any meeting of AA he wanted, even those that were closed to alcoholics. Uh, so wherever Father Ed traveled, uh, he would attend AA uh, meetings. Uh, he even wrote to Bill at one point saying that he had used AA, he was using AA shamelessly as a lonely hearts club. Uh, so, uh, so no, he wasn't an AA member, wasn't an alcoholic, uh, but he felt that um, those who participated in that fellowship were really the most uh, blessed. Uh, th th thank you for, for, for asking, because I think it's very important to em emphasize uh, that all the dedication with which he engaged in that ministry was as someone who was uh, from the outside. Uh, is there another question? I see a couple. So, Dr. Goldstein, thank you very much for this talk and, and your work. I have two uh, just short questions. Uh, in the Soul of Sponsorship, there's a reference to a chart that Doc, uh, the Father Ed had in uh, his office there in St. Louis in the Queen's work that showed the relationships between the spiritual exercises and the, um, and the 12 steps. And when I read that, I spent like 30 minutes online trying in vain to find it. I'm wondering if in your research you were ever able to recover or come across that. And the second question is much simpler. Simply, um, did Father Ed have any role, any influence or involvement in the development of AA literature? Thank you. Thank, thank you for those, for those questions. Is, is, is it fa Father? Uh, well, first of all, Father, if you saw me beaming with like the most goofiest grin on my face as you were asking about the chart, I was thinking that your guardian angel and my guardian angel must be in cahoots because I too searched up and down for that chart, um, especially since Bill Wilson talked about seeing that chart on the wall of the Queen's work. He said he saw a chart that connected uh, the spiritual exercises with the 12 steps. Uh, and um, so uh, I looked in uh, the... the um, in the Father Dowling archive, no chart. Um, I, I didn't look like throughout the AA archive. I had access to some of the documents from the AA archive because they were uh, there were copies of them at the Dowling archive. But at the time I was doing my research, the AA archive um, was closed because of the pandemic. But I imagined that if any such chart existed, one of the other historians who had researched that that area of history would have found it by then. Um, so then I searched um, the Queen's work file at the Jesuit archive, no chart. The, the Dowling and Father Daniel A. Lord files at uh, the Jesuit archive, no chart. Then I searched the Father John Marcou file at the Jesuit archive. And uh, I don't know if you yet have a, a copy of Father Ed but if you do, uh, you can go to, uh, it would be uh, on about uh, page uh, 238, the chart. Um, but it's not exactly the chart that you've heard of. So what this is, is in 1930, so you have to picture, Father Dowling was doing his MA thesis in the 20s. And, and he did it on uh, the spiritual exercises. And he wanted very badly 
to do his, his dissertation for his doctorate on, this, on the spiritual exercises. And he was prevented because um, he wanted to do it on the psychology of the spiritual exercises, and he was told Jesuits don't do psychology. Uh, you, 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 you know, uh, how times have changed. Uh, and, uh, he, uh, and, and so he had to, you know, give up that dream, you know, only, you know, thankfully to have it given back to him in the form of his work with AA. So meanwhile, in 1930, Pius XI uh, issues uh, a letter um, urging all the faithful, including laity, to make spiritual exercises, commending the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Uh, so um, the you know, Jesuit superiors think, oh my gosh, we've got to start promoting the spiritual exercises. They assign Father Marcou to make a, a flyer, a kind of brochure, uh, a one-page fold-out brochure for the Queen's work on the spiritual exercises. And in the, the um, one page folds out to the Jesuit equivalent of a Playboy centerfold, which is a Thomistic chart detailing all the spiritual fruit of the spiritual exercises for, you know, in, in minute detail. And I'm, I'm sad to say you need a magnifying glass to read this, but thankfully very soon it will be published in readable form on the Jesuit um, Conference of, the, uh, of Canada and United States website. Um, so you can watch uh, for that. Um, so my belief is that this chart was on the wall of the Queen's Work office because it was published by the Queen's Work in 1930. Bill Wilson was visiting in 1941, and Father Marcoux, who made the chart, would have been present at the time of, of, um, of Bill's uh, visit. So I believe that at some point, probably before Bill's visit, Father Marcoux marked up the chart, probably, you know, for Father Ed's benefit, and said, okay, this corresponds to, to step one of, uh, of the 12 steps, this corresponds to step two, and so on. And I go on about that in here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I promised myself I wasn't going to give long rambling answers, and here I have. So I'll give a very short answer to your next uh, question, which was, was uh, there any uh, AA literature um, that uh, was influenced by Father Ed? Very short answer, which is uh, yes, uh, the 12 steps and 12 traditions, and I do talk about that here, so I hate to say, you know, buy my book or take it out of the library, but for the sake of time, I'll say buy my book. Thank you, Father. Uh, so there was another question over uh, here, if the microphone could be brought. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your research. Um, and as uh, someone who's grateful to be sober today, um, I had heard, first heard of uh, Father in a story uh, relating to, you know, my disease, which is three-part, you know, mental obsession, physical phenomenon, a craving, and a spiritual malady. But the, there was an instance, if you came across, I'm just curious if you came across where apparently at some point he had a strong affection for either strawberries or blueberries, um, which, which kind of I was able to relate uh, due to that phenomenon, a craving part of it. And uh, it was almost fatal to him. But uh, I was just curious if that in your, if you also came across that because it made it instant re instantly relatable to to me. Yes, I did come come across that. Um, I I do talk in Father Ed about um, about Father Ed's um, problem with what he himself called called gluttony. Uh, I talk quite a bit about it. I think the strawberry story, the specific story, I don't tell only because um, there's a, a, another a, a very good book called The Soul of Sponsorship. Uh, written by a, a Jesuit, Robert uh, Fitz, Fitzgerald, who I believe had some personal knowledge of recovery. And in that book, which is d d devoted uh, solely to, um, to uh, Father Ed's correspondence with Bill Wilson, he, he tells that story. And, and I, I kind of, I wanted readers to have that joy of finding that there was still more to learn about Father Ed after reading this. So I thought, well, I'll leave the strawberry story for them to discover there. But, um, 
But yes, uh, there, Father Ed uh, says that not only on that occasion, but apparently another occasion as well, he, he was anointed for gluttony, which means that he, he ate like so much that he was actually at, at death's door because he was a, a sick man anyway because of his, his, his disease, his disease, um, the ankylosing spondylitis also, you know, and his lack of mobility, you know, led him naturally to, to obesity and, and to heart uh, issues. Uh, and it wasn't just um, food that he had a problem with. Uh, it was also smoking, and he used the 12 uh, steps to uh, arrest his um, smoking habit. Uh, and I, I talk about that, uh, too, uh, in here. And so, yes, he is very relatable uh, for that. But I, I would say, you know, more than that... Um, Father Ed had a, a real thirst for, for fellowship. The, the more that I've contemplated him, and you know, I've had some time to reflect on his life after writing this. I, I finished this, uh, writing this book about a year ago. I've realized that his great cross was loneliness. Now, um, someone I know who knew him, uh, someone I interviewed who knew him, said that, you wouldn't say that Father Ed was, was a lonely person. Um, Father Ed lived solitude, which Father Ed himself was the first to say was not the same as loneliness. When you have solitude, you are not alone, you're alone with God. Um, and so you're putting your loneliness to use, so to speak, by using it to direct yourself outward and upward rather than being um, turned in upon yourself. But I think that he had to fight every day so that, his, so that he would have the solitude and not the loneliness. And I think that it was um, the uh, Lonely Hearts Club of the, you know, the fellowship that he you know, found with members of AA and other 12-step groups that really helped him to, to bear that, that cross. I thank you for, 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 your, for your question, sir. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, it's been a joy speaking with you. God bless you.